All right, take your Bibles if you would, and let's look at Luke 17. Luke chapter 17. I don't know if you've uh, read some of the classics, but one of them is C.S. Lewis Screw Tape Letters, and I've mentioned it before from time to time, partly because it was one of the one of the classic works that I was given early as a Christian to read. And the book is, is kind of odd and not like normal books because it's basically an attempt to help believers understand the subtleties of temptation, much like uh, Thomas Brooks and Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, some of those Puritan works. Well, C.S. Lewis' work is the same. It, it depicts uh, an older demon named Screwtape, and he's giving instruction to his nephew, Uh, on how to subtly uh, disrupt Christianity, if not uh, destroy souls. His nephew's name is Wormwood. You might have heard those terms because uh, Wormwood, of course, is a biblical term. Several decades ago, though, Dr. Walter Martin, who wrote a classic work on the cults, you might know of it, he also wrote a sequel to C.S. Lewis's work, The Screwtape Letters, and uh, he called it Screwtape Writes Again. And in the volume... Uh, Screwtape writes to Wormwood to tell him specifically how to make sure that unbelievers embrace a form of Christianity while staying lost, while still unbelievers. And Screwtape says to Wormwood, if you can obscure what a true Christian is, there's a good chance that your subjects will embrace what hell considers to be the perfect synonym for true religion, churchianity. In this marvelous imitation of the enemy's church, the enemy, of course, to to screw tape is God. In this marvelous imitation of the enemy's church, everything looks and sounds right and good, but the enemy's spirit is conspicuously absent. And you must arrange to make him a devout Methodist or Anglican or Baptist or Presbyterian or what have you. Make him that. He must come to accept the church as a type of religious social club where people congregate. Nothing more. In a word, Wormwood, help him to become more religious, but for hell's sake, not more Christian, end quote. It's interesting how little in evangelicalism at certain times Satan has to really do to accomplish that. Because at the heart of all of it, sinners love to imagine that we're not really very corrupt or in desperate need. And if we do sin, it's relatively easy to make some amends for these mistakes that we make. And if there's a need to embrace a religion, it needs to be the kind that fits our worldview. And if some religion that we're going to embrace has a teacher or a guru or a savior whose teachings and whose example we're supposed to follow, then he'll also have to fit what we're looking for. He'll have to be the kind of teacher or leader that we want, that we desire, someone that fits who we are or who we want to be. In other words, there is a mentality that says, don't give me a savior who can't hold on to my lifestyle as well as my soul. Don't ask me to follow a teacher whose message is opposed to my thinking and my opinions, or I won't follow. Don't offer me a paradise in the future, some heaven, some future kingdom where I can't indulge myself in all the things I enjoy here, the way I see things here. And whatever you do, don't show me a king who expects my soul devotion and grateful obedience. Like one particular writer wrote in an article, I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love people of different races. I want comfort, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. Yeah, I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. No, no, not the flesh and blood one. He'll keep me from my appointment with the hairdresser and make me late for the party. And he'll soil my linen and break my strand of matched pearls. I'm not going to put up with sweaty shepherds trampling over my nylon carpet with their muddy feet. My name isn't Mary, you know. I want no living, breathing Christ 
but one I can keep in its crib with a rubber band. The plastic one will do just fine. And this is precisely the issue Jesus deals with in this next section here. In verses 20 and 21, Jesus first answers the Pharisees on the nature of the Messiah's kingdom, but he does it by confronting their utter blindness to kingdom realities which have come upon them and are right in front of them. Then in verses 22 to 37, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he he warns them not to set their hearts on their earthly life and possessions as though those things are worth saving at all. Because, look, when the kingdom does come, when Christ does appear, when the king is coming in judgment of the entire world, only fools, he says, will live for what they have here in this life and forfeit eternity. Only fools. It will rush upon them so fast. It will be, he says, as in the days of Noah, when everybody was just going about their business and mocking the eight people that were of God, and it rushed upon them. Or as in the days of Sodom, when people were doing commerce and living their life as if fulfillment were here and it rushed upon them. And then he says, remember Lot's wife? She had her heart in the wrong place. This is what Jesus is going to do. He is going to address these two issues. First to the Pharisees on the nature of the kingdom and, the, and why it is they're missing it. And then secondly, which we'll get to next time, he's going to warn the disciples on where they set their hearts. Because when, when the rush of the judgment of the coming king of kings begins, it will happen so fast it will be like lightning which flashes on one end of the sky and you see its effects over here. It will be global. It will be powerful. It will be shocking. It will be absolutely inescapable. And if you have some notion that something here is worth holding on to, you're sadly mistaken. And by the way, sometimes people might think, well, well, that's what I'll do. I'll just enjoy life here, and then when the judgment comes, I'll just let go of it all then. No, no you won't, because your heart is the issue. You have no guarantee that God will express mercy in that day, as our study of Revelation on Sunday nights has been clearly demonstrating. So note what he says, first of all, here. Let's deal with verses 20 and 21 and, and this question that comes from the Pharisees. Look at verse 20. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor are they going to say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Some of your translations say, within you. The Pharisees were asking a question about the kingdom. Now, I want to say, first of all, this is not a calendar question. This is not, hey, what's the date? Or this is not trying to date the essence of the kingdom's timing. There were other times where they might have wondered that, and certainly God's people have wondered those things. But it is clear in Scripture that the time is fixed by the Father for the return of Christ, and it will happen suddenly and come upon people unsuspectedly. No one knows the day or the hour, the Scriptures say. Nor, however, can we say completely that this question from the Pharisees is, is really cynical. I think there's no doubt probably some hostility behind it because they want him dead. But I don't think it's a cynical question like, can you prove it? Surely they had said that in other contexts. But they were expecting a kingdom. We can't completely rule out, as I said, the fact that they're hostile. They have an attitude. They want him dead. But so far, they... They have said you're a fraud and a blasphemer and your claims about being the Messiah and, and all of that. We, we repudiate, that's for sure. But even if this is not just a, from a genuine question, hey, what is it that is the coming of the kingdom? When will we see it? How will we see it? Even if it's just an honest question, Jesus' answer clues us in on the, the nature of their problem. Notice he says the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, with signs to be observed. So 
It's a question that they're asking a question about observable circumstances that will make it clear to all people that this kingdom, this arrival is upon them. The Pharisees are asking Jesus to give them the lead up, the recognizable political and cultural and situational markers, particularly the the spiritual dynamics that will reflect Israel's greatness. That was on the Pharisees' minds with regard to the Messiah. He's asking them, he, he's ask, they're asking Jesus to give them the signs that the promised kingdom is arriving and that, that there's going to be this rulership they're involved in. Now, we need to clarify something here. Jesus is answering the Pharisees who are already making a mountain of assumptions about the Messiah's arrival. As I've said before, they, they're looking for a military king, a, a king who will recognize and exalt Israel's superiority above other nations, and particularly the Pharisees as the leader of all of that. They have the spiritual status. They believe the Messiah will recognize that they are the theologians and the righteous ones who've kept the law. And so as the leaders of God's chosen people, the scribes and Pharisees and the high priest of the Sanhedrin are the spiritually elite. Surely the Messiah, when he comes, will acknowledge us. He will elevate us. He will coronate us. He will walk through the temple mount with us. At his side or just behind him, the king will recognize that we're the law keepers at the highest level. We are righteous in all that we do. And we're to be honored as those who've made God's A-list. And when Rome starts to push back, we have Jesus the Messiah, or we have the Messiah rather, as the power against Rome. So this is what they were assuming. They will be looking for the signs of the kingdom that put them at the center of its glory and its splendor right along with the Messiah. Now, Jesus is not saying here that at the second coming, there won't be signs at all. In fact, there will be huge signs. And in chapter 21, verse 31, actually turn to, verse, turn to chapter 21 for a moment, because I know some of you who've read ahead in the Gospels would know this. Chapter 21, verse 20, and Jesus, of course, in this entire section is talking about things to come. But in verse 20, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize her desolation is near. Those who are in Judea must flee to the, to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave. Those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. And then, of course, he says, woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, for there'll be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. Now, go down further to uh, the discussion in verse 25 and following. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth dismay among nations, perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men fainting from fear in the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And then he told them that parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees, as soon as they put forth leaves, you see it. You know for yourself that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. You see the language there. There will be signs. You'll recognize it. You'll see it. It's going to come fast. Just like when you see the fig tree and it's just about to be ripe, it happens fast. The same people that see it coming to fruition on the branch are the people who pick it. It's that quick. So you go back to chapter 17. Why is Jesus saying here when he's confronting the Pharisees about missing the kingdom? Why does he say the kingdom of God is not with signs to be observed? Nor will they say, look, here it is or there, there it is. What Jesus is doing here is confronting the Pharisees on their false ideas of what it means to enter and enjoy the promised kingdom of the Messiah. You see, they believed in all the promised blessings but what they refused to acknowledge was their need for a Messiah who would come to redeem. A dead Messiah, a Messiah that would be cut off, a Messiah that would be killed, an Isaiah 53 Messiah, that kind of Messiah. They refused to acknowledge it. In fact, in John chapter 6, when, 
when Jesus had fed the 5,000, and then he says to the crowd that comes, listen, don't be seeking another breakfast or a welfare program. What I want you to do is seek me because I'm the bread. And they got all upset about that. You, you, what do you mean you're the bread from heaven? You're directly from heaven? He said, yes, I'm directly from heaven. And unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you won't see the kingdom. What did he mean? Look, I'm going to have to be a sacrifice. That's what offended them. It wasn't strange to them when he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. They knew it was a metaphor. They knew it was a metaphor because even when Jesus said that very thing in the upper room with the disciples, this is my body, which is for you. It was bread. It was actual bread. There was no miraculous way in which he, he was alive and the bread was him. The whole point was the Messiah, your Savior, is going to be a sacrifice. That offended them. It offended them. A dead Messiah, a cut-off Messiah? Are you kidding? The Messiah comes, acknowledges our greatness, and we go, to, we go into the splendor of the kingdom and crush Rome. And you acknowledge our righteousness. And Jesus says, you're mistaken here. I came to lay down my life for sinners. Look ahead into the conversation that he was having with his disciples just a bit after that. Notice he says in verse 22, he said to the disciples, we'll, we'll get to this next week, the days will come when you'll long to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you'll not see it. What do you mean? I thought the kingdom was going to be here. No, there's going to be a season where you're going to be wishing and longing for this imminent return of Christ. And they're going to say to you, look there, look here. Don't go away and run after them. Why? Because when it comes to the generation it comes upon, it is going to be like lightning when it flashes from one part of the sky and shines to the other. So will the Son of Man be in his day. His day. Now notice the next verse. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected, notice, by this generation. Ah, that gives us a clue. First, he must suffer and be rejected by the current generation. Who is the current generation? Israel. Who is he talking about? The Pharisees in verse 20. So what does he mean in verse 20 when it says the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed? He's talking about his first coming. Look, I'm here right in front of you, and you think there's this great splendor that's going to come. No, no, no. Your generation is going to reject me. Your generation is the generation that is going to put me through what I must go through and what you must embrace in order to enter the kingdom. And you're missing it. You're completely missing it. He had come to lay his life down for the unrighteous and the sick, the needy, the spiritually needy. And they didn't think they were sick and they didn't think they were spiritually needy. It simply wasn't the Messiah they had in mind and it wasn't the kingdom that they wanted to arrive. Whether it was a leader in Israel in Jesus' day or a religious leader of some other belief system, the average broken life looking for healing through Jesus, through some paradise or some arrival in heaven, isn't found on human terms. It comes on God's terms. It's not as the world imagines. The world imagines that kingdoms change and rise and fall by the same things. Power shifts and forebodings, power struggles and intra-leadership battles, peace talks, treaties, things like that. Military revolutions and coups and sanctions. That's all we see. That's all we know. That's how it's done. Ceremonial transfers of power, a decentralized vice regency that goes out from a ruler, and then democracies all over the globe. This is how we see kingdom rule. And we, we think, just like the Pharisees at times, well, I, I imagine what I imagine, and the kingdom, the king himself, the coming of Christ, ought to have some of these same characteristics, or it doesn't make sense to me. And Jesus says, it's not going to be like that. You know, you Pharisees miss it because you want a Jesus of your own kind. You want a Messiah of your own kind, rather. You want a king of your own kind, a kingdom of your own kind. Now, we've already seen that in our study of Luke that Luke loves the term the kingdom of God. He uses it 32 times in this gospel and several more in the book of Acts. Jesus spoke of his future kingdom. 
the actual full expression of his kingdom, when every promise would be fulfilled to the letter, Matthew 6, verse 10, he said, pray this way, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. That's right. There's a future kingdom of Christ. It is going to be a literal kingdom. The Old Testament promises it. Jesus spoke of it in the New, New Testament. His will will be done across the globe. Pray that way. Your kingdom come. What's he talking about? The literal fullest expression of the kingdom of Christ on earth. The thousand years. Matthew 25 says the same thing. Verses 31 to 46. The king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And we've already seen in Luke's gospel, Jesus sent the disciples out. Hey, preach the kingdom. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to bring the power of uh, miraculous healing as a demonstration that God is doing a work. So to proclaim the kingdom of God, that's what we do until the fullest expression of it. We proclaim the kingdom of God. We proclaim Jesus as the only sovereign. The requirements for citizenship, we proclaim those too. Repentance and faith. We proclaim the joyful anticipation of the fullest expression of it in the return of Jesus Christ and his setting up of his kingdom in its final glory. And so because of those realities, we warn sinners of what's to come. But here's what we do. When we tell them there's coming a king and there is a kingdom and that he will judge and, and that they must turn to him before it's too late. When we tell them that, we give them the requirements on God's terms. The terms that God says are required for entrance into the kingdom. That's what we give them. Jesus spoke of a kingdom that was to come. And yet he spoke of a kingdom that had already come upon the people who saw him personally and heard him teach and witnessed his kingdom power and his glory, though it was greatly veiled. That's right. There is the final expression of the kingdom. And that when Jesus came on the earth, he was the king. He is the king. And he was there to accomplish his first work, which they totally missed. But as king, the power of the kingdom was on the earth in Christ. The rulership, the sovereignty, the character of God was all displayed in Jesus. The glory of the Father was witnessed by those who saw him in Christ, the God-man. And so he would often say things like that. Matthew 12, verse 28. If it is by the Spirit of God that I do these casting out of demons, then the finger of God is active and the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's right. He said that. Look, you think I cast out demons by the power of Satan? It, but if it is by the power of God, then the power of the kingdom is right in your face. It's right near you. It's on the earth in front of you. You better not miss it. He said the same thing, Luke 10, verse 9. I want you to heal those in the city who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. That's right. Healing power in an instant with a word or a touch, no rehabilitation. That is the divine regenerative ability and power of God himself. When that kind of power was on display in Jesus' ministry and his disciples, the kingdom of God has come near. It's in your face. It's right near you. That's right kingdom was near because its king was on the earth. What was he doing? He was fulfilling the righteous works that he purposed to do to accomplish the dawning of all that God had promised. It was the dawning of the power. We sometimes say inauguration of the power. In other words, as the Lord walked the earth in his first coming, he himself is the arrival of the dawning of the kingdom. The full expression of it with him on the throne and his people and only righteousness, that is not here yet. But the dawning of that power came with the king who has that power. He himself is the, is the issue. The fullest expression of it is yet to come. But the king, the savior, was on the earth and he was bringing the new covenant and he was fulfilling the saving promises that are a part of the ultimate expression of the future kingdom. If you miss the king, you miss the kingdom. If you miss Jesus as the Messiah, you miss the kingdom. That is Jesus' point to the Pharisees. 
This is why he said when he preached his first sermon in his old hometown in the synagogue and he opened up to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. He said, look, I'm anointed with the spirit and I am the dawning of the new kingdom. Today, this scripture, the one who would come, the servant of God, who would be filled with the spirit to heal and to, to redeem, that's fulfilled today in your hearing, he said. Well, the kingdom wasn't here in its literal earthly form. In its fullest expression, it wasn't here, but he was saying, the king is here, and the king with his power is here, and so the dawning of the kingdom is here. You better not miss it. So he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, Mark 1. And, you know, the Pharisees the whole time, they're like, yeah, kingdom? Really? What kingdom? I mean, you're, you're weak and, and everybody's against you and Israel doesn't even believe in you. We don't even believe in you. You can't be the Messiah because you haven't convinced us. He said, that's no proof that I'm not the Messiah. In John chapter 6, he said, that's no proof. I can tell you this, all that the Father is calling and drawing, they do come to me. Wow, that was serious. The Father must not be drawing you. Because you are hardened in your heart. Wow, that's serious business. Listen, they missed it because the beginnings of it, the dawning of it, the power of it in the presence of the king is not what they wanted. They were not going to acknowledge the only way into the kingdom was through Jesus. They were not going to acknowledge that. And so Jesus reproves them. It's not as you imagined, men. The kingdom of God right now is not coming with the signs to be observed. That'll be for later. As he told the disciples, first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So notice verse 21, nor will they say, look, here it is or there it is. In other words, it isn't here yet. You're not going to have a bunch of people running around who know the king and know the kingdom saying, here it is right, right here. Because in his first coming, that wasn't the point. What was the point of his first coming? He says it in verse 21. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Some translations say within you. Look, I'm convinced that this can't be a statement. The, the word within you or inside of you, as this can be translated, is often translated that way. And and it takes that meaning in some context. But it's strange to me that if Jesus said the kingdom is inside you and he's talking directly to the Pharisees as distinct from the disciples, verse 22, then he would be saying the kingdom is inside you Pharisees. That's why you're not understanding it. Well, that's very, very difficult to conclude because the Pharisees are hardened against him and he is telling them they missed it. So... I believe this is probably better translated right in front of you. The kingdom, behold, just look, it's right in front of you in me. In me. Now, is there a spiritual nature to the rule of Christ in the hearts of his people? Yes, and that's been a popularized view because of the already not yet dynamic of, of what we experience now as Christ is our Lord and Master, and yet we're waiting for the fullest expression of the kingdom. That's true. But I don't believe this is essentially that dynamic. What is being said here to the Pharisees, look, you're missing it because you won't accept me. And if you miss me, you miss the kingdom. You want a Messiah of your own making. You want a Messiah of your own crafting, your own interests, what you want according to your desires, and that's why you're missing it. In other words, they wanted a kingdom without facing Jesus' claims to be the Son of Man. You're not the Son of Man. Well, you're going to miss the kingdom because I am the Son of Man, and if you don't accept me as the Son of Man, the Son of God, you're going to miss it. So you're looking around for some political maneuver. You're looking for me to be installed as king. You're looking for some coronation, some transfer of power, some peace talks. You're missing it. I'm right here in front of you. Kingdom power is upon you right here in me. If you reject me and the only way you get into the kingdom, which is me, it's over. But they didn't want to deal with entrance to the kingdom on his terms. You know what? They wanted to enjoy paradise just like people do today. People want a heaven. Oh yeah, I want, I want a heaven. 
If there is one, man, I want it. I want to enjoy all the blessings of God if there's God and, the, and he's going to give blessings to human beings. I want to get those things free and clear. And, and I want that. And if you're saying to me, I have to come to the king of kings on his throne. Well, okay, he can sit on his throne. But, but if there are terms for entrance that, that don't fit my, my way of thinking, it's not my king. But I still want heaven. I still want the joys of paradise after this life. I still want the, the end of all the suffering. What are God's terms? And why do people miss Christ today? They miss it the same way the Pharisees missed it. They're looking for something else. What are God's terms? Well, very simply, here they are. One, a full confession that as condemned sinners, we don't belong to the kingdom. We have no right to the kingdom. A full confession that as condemned sinners, we don't belong to the kingdom. You can read it, Romans 1. There are none righteous, no, not one. Did you know that the seeker-sensitive movement completely blew it? Because the Bible says there are no seekers. There are none who seek for God. They say, well, what are people who are interested in, in going to those churches? How did they fill up so fast? People were looking for a Jesus of some kind, a Christ who fit their model, their motif. But what God wants is a full confession that you're not a seeker, that you never would without his grace, and that to, to know your sin and see its condemnation is to see yourself rightly, and his terms for entering the kingdom are a full confession that you don't belong in the kingdom. You see, Israel believed they deserved the kingdom because of their ethnicity, if you were Jewish, and their attempts to obey the law. God gave the Jewish people the law. He gave us the sacrificial system. He gave us all these wonderful oracles and graces and the word of God. And if we just obey it, uh, we, we are the special chosen ones of God because of our national, nationality and because God chose us to obey the law. And of course... Of course, when the law's standard of righteousness proved too much, too unbending, you know what they did? They didn't cry out to God, we need your grace to obey the law. No, there were some generations that did that. Many generations, including the one talking to Jesus right here, they just rewrote the law. They just rewrote external requirements to make it simpler, to make extra things to do so that they could appear as though they were obeying the law. That's what they did. And they excused their sinful attitudes and their sinful heart and their secret sins against God. And they put up a storefront to obey and said, we are righteous. Look, God requires a full confession that you don't deserve the kingdom. You don't belong in the kingdom. You're a condemned sinner. That's the first thing he requires. Secondly, he requires a complete turning from the love of sin and of unrighteousness. A complete turning from the love of sin and unrighteousness. Doesn't mean you're not going to battle sin as a Christian. Doesn't mean that Christians don't have a problem with loving the world and sin and the old appetites. Those things are there. But when you come to Christ by faith, you are repudiating your sin. You are saying, I am unrighteous and I want to live for Christ. I hate sin and I hate its offense against God and I want to be forgiven. I want the love of Christ. And those are his terms. I want to sacrifice for sin because I can't do it. I want the power over sin because I don't have it. I turn from my love of sin because I don't want to love it. I don't want to love the world. I want to love Christ. Listen, Israel was offended at the idea of a Messiah that would die for their sin because they didn't think they had any sin. You know what? Jesus' terms are a complete turning from a love of sin. Number three, and here it is, he, his terms are this, a humble entrusting of your life in eternity to Christ. A humble entrusting of your life in eternity to Christ. On this basis, because you believe that his sacrifice is the only worthy payment for sin. And his life is the only, listen, the only perfect righteousness to cover our unrighteousness. To make us acceptable to God. And we believe he rose from the dead to secure our eternal life in glory. There it is. 
entrusting your life and eternity to Christ because we believe those three things. His sacrifice is the only worthy payment. His righteousness is the only perfect righteousness to cover mine because I can't be. That's what makes me acceptable to God. One time when I believe in Christ, his righteousness covers me, I'm acceptable. From then on, I'm a citizen of the kingdom because I confessed that his righteousness is the only perfect righteousness and mine is nothing. And thirdly, that his resurrection is the power that brings my eternal life about. Listen, the kingdom, according to Israel, would come without such things. And so they totally missed Jesus the king right in front of them, in their midst, because they wanted a kingdom on their terms. And then, here's one more final term. Not only does Christ want a full confession that we're condemned sinners and don't belong to the kingdom... Not only does he require a complete turning from our love of sin and unrighteousness and turning to love Christ and want his forgiveness, not only is there to be a humble entrusting of our life and eternity to him in faith, but there's to be a a total offering of ourselves, our life and our eternity to Christ as our Lord and Master, worthy of our worship. Just a commitment on the inside, a conviction that, that we owe him as our Master, our devotion and our worship Because he's worthy. Listen, beloved, those are the terms of entrance into the eternal kingdom of the king. And people today want paradise and heaven and a kingdom if there's going to be a kingdom. And they even attach themselves to churches where the the name of the Messiah, the Savior, is Jesus. But do they want these terms? Do they come on these terms? Admission that I'm worthy of condemnation and don't deserve the kingdom? What? What are you talking about? I'm worthy. I may not be perfect, but nobody else is either. So we're even. Why should I be singled out? And what about the good things I do? I really mean them when I do them. And when I do better things than than I could do or could have done. I feel good doing them. And I trust that doing them is making me a more worthy person, a more righteous person, worthy of respect of others and worthy of the reputation that, hey, he's a good person with a good heart, worthy of God's notice, especially if there's going to be a day of reckoning. I should be worthy of his notice because I did some good things. What is the term of the kingdom? Admission that you're worthy of condemnation. All your, all your works is nothing. But people don't want that kind of Jesus. They want a Jesus that, that takes into account their goodness. Then it's not by faith, is it? It's not by faith in a Savior who himself is the perfect righteous standard that makes us acceptable to God by covering us. When God puts his righteousness to my account in the eternities, we, we don't want that kind of Jesus because we want to feel that the things we did do were worthy of God's eye. That's not, that's not going to be good enough. The term of the kingdom is complete confession that we're unworthy. A complete turning from the love of sin and unrighteousness and turning to the forgiveness of Christ? Really? Can we really call the bad things we indulge in sin? And if it doesn't hurt anyone else and it fulfills my desire so that I'm happy, why do I have to turn from it? I would have to turn from it. And by the way, even if somebody does get hurt by my bad choice, most people deserve it for what they've done to me anyway. I've been victimized. Why shouldn't they be victimized? And besides that, God himself, if he does exist, hasn't given me the things that I need. So why should I live for him? See, those are human terms, beloved. We even will think on this issue, hey, I'm only human. Why should I be expected to give up what I enjoy for a life that seems so foreign to the culture? Man, if I, if I live for Jesus, all that's going to do is isolate me from the mainstream. I'm not even going to have a good life here. And after all, I go to a church where a preacher tells me this is the best life. Go for it. Those aren't the kingdom's terms. What about faith? 
What about humbly entrusting your life and eternity to Christ because you believe his sacrifice is enough? Oh, people say, I believe in Jesus. I know that he died for my sins and that he gives eternal life, but you're asking me to live according to what he says in the Bible? Man, the Bible says some very hard things. Salvation is by grace, not of works. Man, I can't accept that a person's good deeds in this life are counted by God as worthless. That is just too hard for me to accept. You say faith is the only way. That's what the Bible says. Well, I can't accept that everyone who rejects Jesus is headed for eternal judgment. What about well-meaning people in other religions with other messiahs? What about those? And what about this thing where the Bible says humble submission to and love for Jesus, that that's the evidence of your salvation if you submit to his commands? Look, I can't accept the fact that if somebody says they believed in Jesus once and now they reject him, you're telling me they're not not in the kingdom? They're lost? They never really were saved? You're telling me people who were baptized when they were young, prayed to receive Jesus at some meeting, are not going to heaven because they don't believe those things anymore and they live for themselves? Don't you know that life has hurt them and they're angry with God and he hasn't honored all their previous church going and singing and giving? What are the terms, beloved? And the Bible says, Jesus rose from the dead and is coming back for his people one day in glory and judgment. And people say, wow, I I want heaven. But you're, you're asking me to believe the resurrection? That's hard to accept. And his return in power and judgment, not likely, doesn't seem to fit our reality. Look, in the same way that the Pharisees were standing right in front of the king and were completely blind to it because they're saying, well, what are the signs of it? I mean, show us when the kingdom's going to come. And they're thinking in earthly terms that fit their life, fit their lifestyle, made them honored and exalted the way they wanted to be honored. Jesus, who would come, if he is the Messiah, he is going to exalt everything about them, and they have to admit nothing before God. They are self-justified, and he is not the justifier. Those were their terms. And Jesus said, behold, the kingdom is right in front of you. I'm it. You miss me, you miss the kingdom. All that other stuff's coming. But you miss me. You try to get to the other stuff, you're going to be outside the kingdom. It's like Jesus said in John 10, shepherds who climb up some other way rather than come through the access gate, the only access gate God has provided, they're false shepherds. And he meant Israel's leaders. They're telling you to come up some other way than through the Jesus of Nazareth. You shouldn't do that. People do the same today. They want a ruler on their terms. They want a king over what we allow him to control. They want a savior who pardons them, but doesn't withhold anything they want in this world. They want a God who does everything he promises to bring us paradise, but keeps us from any kind of suffering while in this life, even though it's a sinful world and we're, and we're sinners just like the world in its fallenness, they want a God who keeps giving us all of his promises and supplying us with whatever will make us happy and fulfilled. But we will, we will reserve the right to point a finger at him if we don't get what we want, if we have to go through any kind of suffering. And if you're telling me I've got to follow Jesus, well, what demands does he make? Because if he makes demands... If he's not always there to comfort me and protect me from consequences, even the consequences of my foolishness, which makes a mess, and then he wants to make demands of me, no thanks. I'm not coming on his terms. What kind of a kingdom are you seeking? And what kind of Jesus do you want? There's only one. And he said to the Pharisees, I'm right in front of you. And he said from the time of his first coming, he then gets with the disciples and he starts talking to them. And he says, you're going to be in a time period where you're longing for the peace of the kingdom, the days of the Son of Man, even just one day. Just, Lord, give us the relief of one day. Show up. Come. Aren't we there? Aren't you there? I feel that way. Lord, just one day of the Son of Man. Wow. 
how would that would just blow our minds? He says, you're going to long for that. And, and yet you're not going to see it. Why? Because he first must suffer. And here we are 2,000 years later. He has suffered. And the, the global rush of judgment has not yet happened. So we're in that time period. And we're telling people about the kingdom of God. You know what you need to do when you witness to people? Find out what kind of kingdom and what kind of king they imagine. And get at that. What kind of a Jesus and a Messiah and a Savior are you looking for? Because if it isn't the one revealed in Scripture, you're missing him and he's right in front of you. You can believe him by faith and turn from your sin right now. And he promises to forgive all your sin and enter your life and empower you to see things the way they really are. If you don't want that kind of Jesus, the kingdom is not available. Heaven is not for you then. It won't be yours. You'll miss it. The Pharisees missed him and he was right in front of them. How tragic. What about you? What kind of a kingdom and a king are you looking for? Bow with me. Lord, you, you say things to the crowd around you and the implications just explode on our hearts. We know all kinds of people looking for a different Jesus. Our, our entire evangelical culture is fraught with it. And then we think about our own hearts and how often we, as Christians who know you, we still want to tailor make you as, as we see fit so that you'll give us whatever we want and we, we're to live for you and not for ourselves as the next section will demonstrate. We're not to set our hearts on the things of this life. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to see rightly everything you've revealed and to love it as you've called us to love it. And then as we proclaim the kingdom, may we just put it forth and help people see that whatever they're expecting, whatever they're assuming, unless it is on your terms, it's a dead end. It's a dead end. They'll never see the kingdom because they'll never acknowledge the king. Lord, help us to articulate those things the way you did to, to the leaders of Israel who missed it. We pray for mercy for even those here who've heard the message and have always wanted a Jesus of their own making. Soften them. We pray in your mercy. Teach them, instruct them. May they open their hearts and get out of their rebellion and repent. And help us as believers to, to never put terms on anything. Just, just go to your word. We pray it in the name of our King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Amen.